Hey, good afternoon, folks. I'm Luke Swetland with the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History and Sea Center, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to the first Lunch and Learn webinar of 2023 presented by the museum's Plan Giving Advisory Council. Throughout our over 100 year history, the museum has been committed to education in all its forms, and we're pleased to offer a wide variety of programs to the community at no cost, including today's Lunch and Learn about the importance of advanced healthcare planning. Before we get started, I wanna share a little bit about what we have planned for you this year at the museum. Next month, we'll be opening a new exhibit in our Maximus Art Gallery called Drawn by a Lady. This exhibit showcases a selection of early groundbreaking natural history art and writings by a number of women who each had to overcome the restrictive cultural norms of their day to make their contributions to natural history illustration. Then in April, we open an entirely new dazzling mineral exhibit in the mineral hall off the courtyard. This summer, we will of course be bringing back butterflies alive in the Sprague Pavilion. And there will also be a beautiful and whimsical exhibition of works by the well-known graphic artist, Charlie Harper. You may not recognize the name, but you'll definitely recognize his style this summer when you see his work. So there's lots of great things to see and do in the first half of this year. And I hope you take advantage of all the museum and the Sea Center has to offer, starting with this program right now. So now to get it going, I'll turn it over to my colleague, the museum's legacy giving officer, Andrea McFarling. Andrea? Hi, thank you, Luke. My name is Andrea McFarling, and I am the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History's Philanthropy Officer of Legacy Giving. We are happy to share with you this free webinar with helpful information on the aspects of advanced care planning in your estate plans. Today's webinar will start with presentations by our two expert speakers. Time has been allotted at the end for questions as well. Please place your questions in the chat, which you will see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you should have any technical issues today during the program, please email Allie Nygaard at A-N-Y-G-A-R-D at sbnature2.org. This email will also be in your chat and you should have seen it hopefully in some of the communication from us leading up to this event. Uh, feel free to reach out to me if you have any planned giving questions or need more information. I'm here to help you leave your legacy and hopefully you will keep the museum in mind in your planning. Now I'd like in to introduce our speakers, Charles Caldwell and Adriana Marquin. Uh, Charles is the Director of Strategic Advancement at Hospice of Santa Barbara, where he has responsibilities across several areas, including development, marketing, strategic planning, programs, and finance. Charles holds an MA in Mythological Studies from Pacific Graduate Institute and has been with Hospice of Santa Barbara since August of 2015. Adriana is the Community Initiatives Manager at Hospice, where she oversees the expansion of hospice's programs and initiatives, including Me Regala and Get It Done SB, initiatives focused on the completion and education of advanced directives. Adriana holds an MA in Business Administration and has been with Hospice since May of 2015. Charles and Adriana, thank you so much for speaking with us today. I turn it over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Andrea. We so appreciate the opportunity to be here and to uh, speak with everyone. And just want to wish everybody a happy Valentine's Day, uh, a big day for uh, many people. And uh, thank you for uh, um, participating in this uh, um, webinar on the ultimate gift of love, uh, the tie in with Valentine's Day and the gifts that we can give uh, to our family and loved ones through advanced care planning. And just want to take a moment to thank uh, the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History for their support and advocacy for this important uh, topic. And once again, to thank all of you for uh, attending today. So uh, 
This is a community-wide initiative that has been uh, started about two years ago, and we've been uh, um, working hard with many different partners and different organizations to kind of get the word out and help people to complete their advanced directives because it's such an important uh, um, feature for everybody in their lives, and Adriana will go into details. Just a little bit of information. So this uh, initiative, we have a, a vision, which is really to ensure that everyone in South Santa Barbara County has an advanced healthcare directive before they need one, because things can get pretty hectic uh, in uh, critical situations. You can see on the screen some of the partners, uh, along with Hospice of Santa Barbara, Cottage Health, uh, we work with uh, Santa Barbara Neighborhood Clinics, with all uh, sorts of different uh, local organizations as well. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, you can see some of them up on the screen. We hold workshops like this with organizations and with their different constituencies. So we've, over the past couple of years, we've held uh, over 60 workshops with 50 different organizations kind of across the spectrum. And this all happens in both English and in Spanish with our two kind of facets of our initiative. Get It Done SB is in English and Mi Regalo, My Gift in uh, Spanish. You'll also be seeing more and more about this in the local community through our PR campaign. We have some bus ads out that you might see, TV PSAs on radio, social media, as we really try and get the word out. And all of you can help advocate with your family and friends about this important. And lastly, just that um, we've had some uh, considerable uh, success in the past couple of years with over 700 uh, more advanced directives being completed and turned into cottage uh, hospital where they can be of the most use and there at the time. So thank you all once again for uh, being willing to join with us. And now I'll turn it over to Adriana uh, so you can carry us into some details. Thank you, Charles. And again, thank you to the museum staff for having us. We're very excited to be here. Um, I will take us along for, uh, for the, the MyCare, but before we jump into the MyCare, you should have received a PDF file. Um, I'll just share a little bit of background. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, what is an advanced directive? Uh, for those of you that are not familiar, or this might be the first time you hear about it, it is a legal document. It's intended for anyone over the age of 18 years old, uh, and it really serves two purposes. The first one is to name the person you have selected as your healthcare agent. This is the individual that is going to speak for you and make decisions on your behalf in case you are not able to make them. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what that is and what that means in just a bit. But the second uh, core uh, purpose that the, the advanced directive serves is to identify the types of medical care that you would like to receive uh, or you would not like to receive in case you are sick or injured or can't speak for yourself. So really the advanced directive is a tool that helps guide our family members about the type of care we want to receive or do not want to receive in the case that we cannot speak for ourselves. This is a legal binding document. There are two ways for us to make it illegal, legally binding. And this document does remain in effect until your wishes change or you complete a new one. We like to say that this document is almost a living document. It does um, change depending on what you need. Now, there are other terms and some of you may have come here because you've heard different things such as living will or medical power of attorney or durable power of attorney. And so I, I am going to define a little bit what these are but will not uh, go into much detail. A living will uh, is something that we find usually within our financial uh, planning when we're doing that. Uh, the difference between a living will and an advanced directive is that a living will will only be enacted if you are permanent, if you are in a permanent state of incapacity. What that means is that if it's temporary, such as a temporary coma that you're expected to recover, your living will will not be able to help with health care decisions uh, during this time. It's truly only when it's a permanent state of incapacity that this living will uh, goes into effect. These, again, tend to be completed with lawyers, uh, especially when you're 
planning for financial or fiduciary responsibilities. So it is important that if you do have a living will, uh, which there is nothing wrong with that, if you choose to go that option, that you make sure that those forms make it to your nearest hospital. One of the things I see oftentimes is folks tell me that they already have this planned out, but that document is in the middle of their financial planning, uh, which is very separate from your medical planning. So if you do have a living will, again, I can't stress this enough, make sure that document makes it to your medical provider so that it can actually be used for what its uh, purpose is. Now, a medical power of attorney, uh, it, it is very similar to a healthcare agent. This is a person that you're going to appoint to make medical decisions if you become um, incapacita incapacitated or cannot make them on your own. Uh, it's a different term utilized more so in the, in the financial world, uh, in the medical world, we use a healthcare agent, but it essentially it means the same thing. Now, the durable power of attorney, uh, this is a legal document that gives one person the ability uh, to make legal, medical, or financial decisions for another person. The difference between this durable power of attorney is that it remains in effect until the person who grants it dies or cancels it. Now, these are just terms. Uh, I know that you've probably heard some of these um, as you've gone out in, in the world and, and seen and heard different things. And so just without going into much detail, the reason why we have so many of these terms is because in the creation of advanced directives and making sure that they make it over to the medical system and trying to uh, create a uniform system, uh, language has just been recycled over and over. So I do want to highlight that there are other terms, but the terms that we will be using in today's presentation um, are others, and I'll, I'll point that out in just one moment. Now, before I move on, I do want to talk about the POLST. This is another form, another document that you may have heard of. The POLST stands for Physician's Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment. It is a bright pink, I don't know if you can see it, it's a bright pink form. Uh, the difference, and I've outlined here, uh, compared to an advanced directive, what is a POLST? It's in the name, it's a physician order. Uh, advanced directives, like I said, are age specific. So anyone over the age of 18 can complete an advanced directive. A pulse is very condition specific. So individuals with life-threatening illnesses, perhaps with advanced illnesses should have a pulse versus anyone over the age of 18 can have an advanced directive. Another difference is that the advanced directive truly relies upon a healthcare agent to make these decisions be heard. The POLST is a standalone document because it is a physician order. The only way that this document comes into effect is if it is signed by a doctor, uh, whereas the advanced directive, you can ut utilize witnesses or notary to make sure that it's, uh, it's valid. Now, another big document or another big difference is advanced directives is a guidelines of care, whereas the pulse is specific statements regarding specific treatments. So the questions are very similar to those being asked by the advanced directive. However, we want to keep in mind that the pulse, because it is being signed by a doctor, is more medically targeted to individuals that have uh, advanced healthcare conditions. They are both legal documents. The only difference is one is signed, must be signed by the doctor, which is our POST. Um, the use of POST is not mandating, mandated, but honoring POST is. So if you do have a POST or an advanced directive, they will both be honored, but a POST does carry a little bit more weight because it is signed by a doctor. So in terms of today and the terminology that we're going to use, I don't want to confuse you. Uh, advanced care planning is the act of planning for our advanced directive. An advanced directive is a document that is uh, valid or legally binding. The MyCare is a document that we utilize in Santa Barbara County. And the healthcare agent is the individual who's going to make healthcare decisions on your behalf. Just want to be clear on our terminology. So let's get started on the types of advanced directives that there are. Like I mentioned, the MyCare is a document that we utilize in Santa Barbara County, but there are many others. For example, Five Wishes, which you may have heard of. Um, there's uh, California specific uh, advanced directives, attorney specific, um, 
there's some for dementia, you know, there's just a variety of documents that are being utilized out there and they are all valid. The only reason why we utilize the My Care in Santa Barbara County is truly for uniformity and to help our ER staff as all of these documents will go and live at the cottage hospital, um, the EMR, I'm forgetting what it stands for, um, your patient record at cottage. And so the people that will have access to this are the, the ER staff. So in terms of uniformity and making sure that uh, they can do their job efficiently, that's really the only reason why we utilize the MyCare. All others, however, are accepted and you are more than welcome to submit any one of your choosing into Cottage Hospital. So I am going to go through the MyCare uh, section by section. We don't have a lot of time today, so I will uh, be moving briefly on some of these sections, but I do encourage you all to ask questions, though there will be a QA and a uh, just before we wrap up. But I, if you do have your document handy or in front of you, if you want to just follow along, um, I would encourage all of you to take this on and complete it for yourself. Uh, as as we mentioned, this is an important conversation and part of our planning uh, for for anyone, right? So I encourage you, uh, if you are so called to complete it as we're going through it, please do so. Um, but we'll have other opportunities for you to ask questions um, towards the end. So let's get started with the my care. Uh, starting on page six and seventeen. Oh, sorry. The let's talk about the required sections. The way that the my care is set up. Uh, there are pages with blue ribbon. These are all the required pages. Uh, it, it shows here page six to eight and nine to 11 are legally required. That completing those pages is what makes that document legal. Um, the other pages, the optional pages, which begin on page 15, uh, those are optional sections. Uh, the optional sections cover things like my values, wishes, and preferences. It's not to say that those sections are any less important. They are actually just as, if not more important. Uh, the difference, however, is that the required sections are asking specifically types of medical care that you want to receive, and that is what's relevant and important to our ER staff. The optional sections are more about um, how would you like your end of life ceremony to look like? Who would you like to be there? Would you like music to be there? So of course, all of these things are important. They are just not relevant to the hospital staff and to allow them to do their job. Um, so I would encourage you to complete all of the sections, uh, but in order to submit the document, all of the required sections need to be filled. And again, those are the ones with the ribbon on each page. Um, next slide, please. So let's talk about who can be your healthcare agent. Uh, as you recall, that's one of the most important things that this document allows us to, to select. This person will be the individual who's making decisions on your behalf if you can't make them. So some of the things, logistical things, is that they have to be 18 years of age or older. Um, and then some characteristical things that you want to look for is that they know you will, that they accept the responsibility. That's huge. When I do workshops, some individuals say, oh, you know, my sister and my sister will do it. I know she will. Uh, but it's so important to have that conversation with your sister, and your sister and to make sure that she's accepting that responsibility. It is a huge responsibility. Keep in mind that when this happens, uh, there's probably going to be some crisis in your family. This individual is going to be talking to the doctors and the medical team and most likely relaying information from the doctors to the rest of your family and your loved ones. So they need to be able to work well under pressure. They need to know what you want and make decisions as if they were, they were you, right? So uh, very important that they accept this responsibility. Uh, other things to look for is can they make decisions in stressful situations? Can they remain calm and think clearly? Um, can, are they somewhere nearby that your medical team can contact them easily? So some, some characteristics, again, just to think about um, and have a conversation with your loved ones about what, what you want. Sometimes individuals uh, may not 
uh, agree with your decisions. And that's okay, as long as they agree to carry forward the decisions that you're making, right? So the conversation is very important when we get to selecting our healthcare agent. Now this document allows us to select up to three agents. We, uh, if you're following along, starting on page six and seven, uh, it allows us to pick up to three healthcare agents. The way that this works, it will be um, by ranking. So the first individual that you put down will be your first healthcare agent, followed by the second and the third. If the medical team cannot get a hold of the first uh, healthcare agent, then they will move on to the second. If the second healthcare agent answers the phone and they get going, but then maybe two hours later, your first healthcare agent shows up, the responsibility or authority returns to your first healthcare agent. So just keep that in mind. If you are selecting more than one healthcare agent, you don't need to select a total of three. You can select only one or only two, all three of them or none, none at all. If you are choosing to not select a healthcare agent, then it's imperative that you actually complete one of these documents because truly what you're saying is that you don't want someone else speaking on your behalf and this document truly will speak on your behalf. So it's so important to select a healthcare agent and if you don't have a healthcare agent that you complete this document. So let's talk about what your healthcare agent can do. We are now on page eight, which is the graphic that's being reflected here. Um, your healthcare agent, uh, the questions there from one through nine give you uh, kind of basic information on what can they and can they not do. So you'll see the yes or the no. It's important that you answer with your initials on each one of the columns as it's, as is the example there. Uh, some of the things that they're asking is, can, can your healthcare agent speak to your medical health providers? Can they plan for health in California or another state? Can they review and release my medical records? So you can go through that list and select yes or no. These are nine very basic uh, instructions that your healthcare agent can do, but they are not meant to be uh, everything, right? So they're, the great part about the MyCare is that it gives you some uh, room. You can see there um, additional information about your healthcare agent. You can see there that you can add additional information. Uh, do you want them to review your documents, perhaps only your medical documents and not your, um, if you have a psychiatrist, maybe you don't want them seeing your psychiatrist medical records. Um, you can get very specific about the types of information or the types of things that your healthcare agent can or cannot do by writing in, in the spaces provided. So do fill out your information, uh, be as specific as possible. Um, oh, before we move on to CPR, there is just a section at the bottom of page eight, which says, when does my healthcare agent's authority become effective? Um, if you sign there, what that means is that you are uh, essentially giving your healthcare agent um, the ability to start making decisions as of now. Uh, remember, if you all are, are healthy and, and just planning advance uh, this does not need to be signed. You don't need to turn that power over to your health, your healthcare agent. Uh, your healthcare agent will become or go into effect as soon as you cannot make healthcare decisions for yourself. Before then, uh, this this document is just it's just there for planning purposes. Um, but if you do sign, what you're saying is that starting now, starting this moment they have the ability to, to do that. So uh, I can't see all of you folks who are joining us today, but for the most part, uh, the, the folks that I do workshops with, you don't need to sign that now. Uh, an example of when you might want to sign that is perhaps if you're, um, a recent example, I worked with an aging man and his daughter, He the, 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 the gentleman was very, uh, he was still very present, but due to the medication that he was taking, he was getting drowsy more often. And so the doctor was having a hard time contacting um, th this gentleman because he was sleeping more than usual. And so in that case, he did give his daughter the ability to start making healthcare decisions on his behalf. And so for them in that situation, it was really just logistical. So just an example of when you can uh, or should sign versus when, when you should not. So let's talk about CPR. And what that means, uh, we're now on page nine. 
CPR, this section gives us three options about what we want. This is one of the choices that it's asking in terms of medical care. Do we want CPR to be done always? Do we not want CPR never? Or only if, and that's number three, only if you have an incurable illness or injury that you're likely to die soon, or if you're not likely to return to a life worth living. Now, before we jump into how to think about this section and, and whether we want to engage in CPR or not, it's very important that we understand what CPR is. Um, most of us have an understanding of CPR based on the movies that we see. And in Hollywood, they portray this as you get CPR done and then you fast forward to the next scene and you, you've made it, you've survived. And unfortunately, that's not reality. Uh, that is a very uh, Hollywood version of CPR. CPR is actually done when your heart has stopped and your breathing has, has stopped. So essentially, um, CPR is done when, when you have stopped breathing. You can't do this on your own. What CPR entails is chest compressions, electrical shocks, sometimes a breathing tooth. And depending on your age and where you are, uh, it's it, it can be detrimental. Uh, it's very likely that your ribs might break and you might have punctured lungs because of that. Uh, and so depending on your age, your uh, other medical conditions that you may have, that might be detrimental, right? Which is why we talk a lot about the, the quality of life. What does a quality of life mean to you? Uh, can for example, someone who might be younger in their early 30s, early 20s, having a broken rib and punctured lungs, their quality of life, they might return, right? They, they might be down for maybe two, three weeks, but then they can get up and, and re regain a life that pretty close to that that they were living before the, the broken ribs and punctured lungs. Now, someone who's uh, maybe 80 or older uh, may not bounce back as quickly as a 20 year old. Right, so let's talk about quality of life. What does this mean to you? What does quality of life mean to you? What are the things that you need to do in order to feel like you, you're living a life worth living? Uh, and those are conversations that you should be having with your healthcare agent. Okay, so with that in mind, going back to the questions and the options that are being selected, when do you want to have CPR? How, you know, never always, um, many folks, when I do this presentation, they say, well, you know, does this mean that the medical team will never do CPR on me? If I say that I never want CPR, does that mean that they're going to let me die? And, and that's not true. The medical team has signed an oath and they will always do whatever's in their power to save you. Um, but a, a CPR, you know, this is ongoing. Do you want this ongoing? Do you want CPR to be completed ongoing to you? Um, or are you okay with, with uh, what that might mean if they don't do CPR? Um, okay, next slide, please. Uh, the, the next question, and, and this is um, the, the one about life-sustaining treatments. Uh, life-sustaining treatments, again, just as the name say it, the, you need these things, you need these treatments to maintain your life. When you start talking about life-sustaining treatments, it means that your body is not operating in a way that is... Um, that it, can't, it cannot sustain itself by, by itself, right? So artificial hydration and nutrition, um, there are different types uh, through your veins or feeding tubes, uh, a ventilator and a dialysis machine. These are the three specifically that this document is asking us about. Do we want these life-sustaining treatments to continue? Uh, and again, the, the questions or the way that you're going to answer, very, very, Simple, you have three questions, you can only answer one. I do not want a life-sustaining treatment. If it has started, I want it to stop. I want to die naturally. The second one, I want life-sustaining treatments only for the purpose of organ donation. And three, I want to continue life-sustaining treatments. So again, three questions, we can only pick one. What is it that we want? Um, with life-sustaining treatments, uh, some, you know, oftentimes when, when I do this presentation, um, it's a very personal decision, what you want, uh, thinking or taking into account your religious beliefs, um, 
where again, where are you on the spectrum of age and health wise? Uh, but some of the things that folks have added that I, I thought were neat just over the time that I've been doing these workshops, some folks have added on here that they only want health, um, they, they only want life sustaining treatments until their family gets to the hospital to say goodbye to them. Um, so again, this document gives us the ability to cater what our medical choices should be and how we want that experience to look like for ourselves and our loved ones when that time comes. So do fill in in those lines there. Be specific about what you want um, your life-sustaining treatments to look like. Um, another thing that's often shared in this section is how long. How long is long enough for you? Uh, do you want to try life-sustaining treatments for a week, for a month, for three months, for a year, right? What does that mean and how does that look like financially for your family? Do you have the means to ensure that that treatment can be sustained over long periods of time? Uh, does your religion play a role in, in having these life-sustaining treatments? So many different aspects to think about in terms of deciding what types or how often or how frequently do you want life-sustaining treatments? Uh, next, we get to organ donation, which is page 11 of this document. Um, organ donation, just some quick facts about organ donation. Anyone can donate regardless of age. Uh, the, the, this document asks us if we want to donate everything, whatever is needed and whatever I can give uh, to be specific about the types of organs that I want to donate, or if I want to donate whole body research. If you choose this option of donating your whole body to research, it must be done while you are alive. Uh, a lot of these different schools or organizations have very specific criteria that is almost impossible for your loved ones to follow up on after you've, you've died. So if you do choose the route of whole body research, um, please make sure to plan that ahead of time. And I'm happy to help answer any questions if you are interested in that. But whole body research must be planned and organized prior to um, and any, any medical uh, accidents that may happen. Now, once a organ donation process is complete, in Santa Barbara County, we work with a third party. Um, they're called Donate Life, I believe. Um, I think I'm blanking on their name. But uh, your cottage doctor will not be the doctor overseeing your organ donation. They keep those separate. So there's two different teams working on that. Once the process is complete of the harvesting of the organs and, and taking all of that, the body will be returned to the family for any funeral uh, processes to, to continue as normal. Or if you want to be incinerated, that is also done at that time. Uh, costs related to organ donation are not the family's responsibility. However, the funeral and cremation costs are. Uh, so just keep that in mind uh, if you're choosing to donate um, very important to be specific. Um, I'll share a story about a woman who I worked with recently. She, uh, very young, um, middle-aged woman, she was sharing with me that her husband uh, had unexpectedly died. Uh, they, he was healthy and, and, and all of a sudden he died. And so what made it so much difficult is that he was a donor and she was not aware of that. He had signed up through the driver's license, um, the DMV, to donate organs. And so when he died, the organ, the, the donation team came on board and they, they took what they needed. And in his case, it was his skin. And so what that prompted the family is that they couldn't do an open casket uh, funeral, which is what they would have wanted to celebrate him at end of life. Um, I share that story. I know it's powerful, but I share that because it's so important to share with our loved ones what we want, right? It's important to be specific about the type of organs that we want to donate. There's a little image on the screen um, that there's life-saving organs and then there's healing tissues. We can donate all of that, but being very specific about what do you want to donate and how does it, how does that affect the way that your life is celebrated at the end, right? And then also just prepping our family for that. Uh, this, this poor woman, not only was she distraught because she had unexpectedly lost her husband, but then the emotional toll of not being able to celebrate him the way she would have wanted was even more difficult for her and her family. So 
I share that with you. If you are a donor, um, please uh, be very specific about what you want to donate and make sure that you are communicating that with your family. Now, to make this document legal, um, there are two ways to do that. The first is that you have two witnesses, and the second is that you have a notary uh, public present to complete this document. Um, for witnesses, we do, uh, it's very specific about who can be a witness for this document and who cannot. Uh, you can see here that the witnesses need to, both of these witnesses must be able to confirm that they know you. They must be 18 years of age or older. They cannot be your healthcare agent. They cannot be your part of your health team or your healthcare provider. Um, if you live in a nursing home, they must not work there. So it's very specific about who can be a witness and who cannot. One of those witnesses will sign again at the bottom. So you need a total of three signatures with two witnesses. And what that second signature means is that they're not related by blood or marriage and that they will not receive money or property after your death. If you're choosing to go the witness route, that's totally fine. It, it, it's still a legal way of making your document uh, complete, but I can't stress enough how important all of these um, prerequisites are for your witnesses, uh, because it would be a shame for you to do all of this work and then this document not be valid because you missed one of these um, criteria, right? So if you are choosing to go the witness route, make sure you double and triple check who you're asking to be your witnesses. Now on the flip side, there is a notary public um, through the initiative and the, the work that we're doing, we are offering free notary services for individuals that complete or participate in any one of our workshops. Personally, this is my preferred route only because you don't have to worry about who's signing and do they meet the criteria and I need two or three people, right? Like you just don't have to worry about that. Uh, so the notary, all that you, all that the notary needs is a valid ID and for you to sign this in front of the notary. Now there is a very uh, small section there called the special witness requirement, which is really intended for individuals who live in long-term care facilities. That special witness requirement must be signed by a long-term care ombudsman. It's really just to check some balances if you live in a nursing home or a long-term care facility, just to make sure that, that you uh, as an individual are wanting to complete this document and that you're not being forced to. So that's really, um, that special witness requirement only applies if you live in a long-term care facility. And if you do, then you should have access to a long-term care ombudsman to help sign that and make that uh, complete. Now, now that you're done with the document, because essentially, you know, I, I always tell people it's a very um, easy document, but it's not simple. In an, uh, all in all, uh, this document probably only asks us, um, let's say, let's say six questions, that's all it asks us, but it's not an easy process, right? So if you can get through making those decisions, then you have completed a document. And so who should have copies? It's very important that you keep the original. Remember, this is going to be the document that's going to be utilized in case of an emergency. So you want to keep the original. And it's very important that your healthcare agent also has a copy. If you have a primary physician or any specialty uh, doctors that you're working with, making sure that they have a document uh, the nearest hospital, in this case, it would be Cottage Health. But if you uh, commute perhaps to Ventura, you wanna make sure that they have your document on file there. All of these documents uh, are valid within the state of California. It, it's a thing, you can go to any hospital and ask for an advanced directive. If you don't have a file, uh, already at the at the hospital, they will make a file for you just to hold this document for you. Um, so hospitals want you to have a document, and they'll make sure that you have access to it, and that they can they are saving it for you as well. Um, other individuals that should have a copy is family, as you deem appropriate. If you have an attorney, making sure that they have one, um, and your healthcare agent. Now, when do we review or update? I mentioned earlier that this is a, a living document. And what I mean by that is that you, let's think about your current life stage. So for example, 
someone who is younger and has no children, their decisions and who they selected as their healthcare agent is going to be very different than someone who's a middle-aged person with uh, teenage children, right? The life stage that you're in is going to uh, reflect what your decisions are. Someone who's not married perhaps is going to put down their parents as a healthcare agent, but when they transition and get married, they might want to change that or update that to be their, their spouse. So some of the things that we encourage folks is to think about your current life stage, most importantly, and how that's, that's evolving. Um, but also some other markers are when you form a long-term relationship, for example, a marriage or perhaps a divorce. Um, maybe your ex is your healthcare agent and you no longer want them to be that. Um, when you have a, ch a child, uh, if you have a high-risk job or just started a high-risk job, um, perhaps military, if you've enlisted or retired from the military, um, signing up for Medicare, of course, when you have a life-threatening illness, uh, and definitely when you're close to end of life. But I, I want to make sure that I'm stressing enough that this document is not about end of life. It truly just is a tool for us to plan how we want our care to be um, completed. It, it, I'm assuming most of us probably the majority drive. We can be in an accident at any point uh, and it's really important that we have somebody that can speak on our behalf, even if it's just temporary, right? So um, this is not only for older folks who are close to end of life. This is for anyone 18 years of age or older who, um, who just wants to plan and, and be prepared for when and if that happens. Now, other things to consider. Uh, the first one is capacity and dementia. This document um, early intervention is important, right? So planning is super important. Individuals who have uh, perhaps early stages of dementia, it's very important that you're speaking to your doctor about capacity and dementia. I have had so many families that come to me when the dementia is already advanced and they find themselves asking, what would they have wanted? What do I do? How do I take care of them? And so I can't stress enough how important it is to just plan ahead of time. If you have dementia um, in your family, definitely another reason why you want to plan, uh, plan ahead. Now, if, if you've already been diagnosed with dementia or a loved one has been diagnosed with dementia, it's very important that you're connecting with your medical doctor and ensuring that they still have the capacity to do this document. Other things to consider are financial considerations. Um, I touched a little bit on it when we talked about life sustaining treatments and you know, is there the financial backing to maintain a life sustaining treatment over three months, right? What resources are available? Are you dependent on Medicare or Medi-Cal to help with some of these costs? Do you have long-term care, private insurance? Um, do you have personal resources or assets that can help with these medical costs? Uh, unfortunately, the financial consideration is tied a little bit to our, our healthcare decisions, right? So keeping that in mind as we're making decisions and as we're selecting and talking to our healthcare agents. Now, things to be remember to to remember, especially as you're starting this conversation. I don't know how many of you came here with with your healthcare agent in mind, or if you even knew what you were getting yourself into. But just some of the things to to remember is that this conversation is difficult, right? Talking about our future selves um, is difficult. I remember when I did my document; it seemed easy enough, and I filled out my name and did all of that, but when I started thinking about what is the type of care that I would want, I envisioned a future self and my family suffering. And, and it was an emotional roller coaster for me to complete my document, right? So um, some things to remember is just be patient uh, and committed. Make sure that you are being honest with yourself about what you want and that you when you share with your loved ones, it's coming from a place of planning, right? And not a, not a doomsday experience. It's not going to happen tomorrow, hopefully, right? But just just a planning uh, way for us to, to gift our family peace of mind when that time comes. Um, every attempt at a conversation is valuable. Uh, and sometimes um, 
our loved ones aren't going to be as open or receptive of it. So oftentimes it takes a few conversations before you can get anywhere uh, concrete or, or at least that they're responsive with it. So go at your own speed. You know your family members uh, do what you think is best, uh, but, but be consistent. Make sure that you are having the conversation and that you are uh, planning because it is important. Uh, now, some next steps. Uh, I know that I went very quickly. We have some time for Q&A, but because we knew that this session was going to uh, perhaps elicit a lot of questions that we may not have time for, we are actually partnering with the museum to invite you back to an in-person workshop on Thursday, March 2nd from 12 to 1.30. It will be at the auditorium at the museum. We will have facilitators. We will have a free notary. You, if you complete a document, you will have access to a cop copier. Uh, and we will make sure that your document is submitted to Cottage Health. So I invite you to put the, the date, save the date, Join us, come back with questions, come back with your healthcare agent. We would love to make sure that all of the, the folks that are joining us today have their document completed. So um, if you are interested, please RSVP to Andrea, her information is there. Uh, and if you can't join us, we do have one-on-one -on -one assistance uh, through trained facilitators, and we can certainly find other avenues for you to get your questions answered and your document completed. So uh, give us a call. Now, before I open it up to questions, just some resources, you can find our websites there. Get It Done SB is our English ACP initiative, uh, and Mi Regalo is our Spanish initiative. Cottage Health has a wonderful um, department solely focused on ACP, so you can find many resources to them. We have community workshops, facilitators. I've added the information for Pulse for anyone who's interested. That's the, the bright pink paper. You can find out more there. And then starting the conversation is a great website that has tips on how to start the conversation with your loved ones. So if you are finding that challenging, I invite you to check them out. They have a ton of resources, uh, videos, prompts, different life stages uh, and how to bring it up. So do check them out. And with that, I think I am going to um, ask my colleagues to join me if there are any questions. Actually, we wanted to just take a couple of minutes to again, thank you for being here on Valentine's Day and to do a quick recap and then we'll go, I know you're eager to get to questions. So there is a lot of information that was given today. So let's just highlight a few things we wanna take away today. An advanced healthcare directive is very important and an integral part of your estate planning. It really helps support all of the other planning you've done. Um, it can help avoid or reduce potential conflict uh, during a crisis. Uh, it can help uh, reduce indecision at a time of crisis. Uh, and you know your wishes will, will be met. The laws regarding advanced directives, we wanted to bring this up, may vary a bit from state to state as, and along with some of the de definitions that Adriana mentioned. So it's important to execute a document that is valid for the state where you live and where you expect to receive medical care. Uh, of course, as has been noted throughout today's talk, advanced directives should be completed while you have the mental capacity to legally execute this. Um, so since the statistics for getting some kind of form of dementia rise with age, it's important to not wait too long. Get this done now while you can. And to ensure that your wishes are actually followed, be certain the person you appoint as your agent understands your wishes and will abide by them. After all, they have the legal right to make decisions for you um, once this comes into play. So who do you trust to speak for you? Are they able to advocate for you? And will they respect your wants and needs? I remember at work one day hearing someone say that their father executed uh, an advanced care directive, but they weren't going to follow it. 
So you having these conversations and understanding that that person will abide by your wishes is very important as well. So do you have an old document? Uh, does it still reflect what you want? Um, as we mentioned, there are, just like your other estate planning documents, these should be reviewed periodically. Um, so it also comes into play, this document, after you pass. And that's something that's often forgotten on, um, in doing this. Funeral homes will ask for it. Uh, when my dear mother-in-law passed away, the first thing the hospital asked us for was this advanced directive so we could take have the body sent to the mortuary. First thing the mortuary asked us for was this document so we could proceed with the cremation that she wanted. Uh, and then later when we had her ashes buried in a service, I actually had to go home and get the document uh, to bring all the way back to, to the um, cemetery. So these, these are important documents to have access to for your family. So who should have a copy? As we mentioned, your appointed agent, your physician, your attorney perhaps, and here, here locally, Cottage Hospital has that program where whether you have medical records at Cottage or not, you can create a dummy account and they will hold this on file. It is also um, important to make sure that this replaces any prior document. If you're gonna execute this, these new documents that we've shared with you, uh, you may want to, and it's likely you may make some changes from an old document. It's important to discuss those changes with your doctor, with your loved ones, and make sure everyone is clear on the changes. This will automatically, by date, replace any older documents, but you may want to get some ask for those older documents back or have them destroyed just so there is no confusion. Remember that there are specifics when dealing with witnesses signing these doc documents, um, but you can also just have it notarized and may wanna consider that. You may also wanna do some additional reading and research regarding some of the terms that were discussed as far as treatment options while you have time to do so now and before finalizing these documents. And let me say, remember, it's up to you to take the initiative and express your wishes. Your family or loved ones are not likely to bring this up to you. Talking about these issues are emotional and uh, difficult. But think about when and where you might wanna have these important conversations with them. And when you share with them, don't hesitate to talk about your beliefs, your personal concerns, that may actually help them. Uh, and because we are doing this on Valentine's Day, it is a blessing to have this. Um, my mother had, had dementia and I had to actually step into the role as her healthcare power of attorney. And it was very comforting to know that we had these discussions in advance and that I was, no matter what she may say with her dementia, that I was doing the right thing and what she would have wanted. So with that, let's turn to some questions. And let me start off by asking both of you, Charles and Adriana, uh, who decides if I'm no longer able to make my own decisions and when? I'm sorry, didn't you say that one more time? Who decides? Yeah, how does that happen? If, if I am no longer able to make my own decisions, perhaps due to dementia, who, who makes that decision? 
Well, if there is a MyCare or a healthcare directive in place, the healthcare directive or the healthcare agent comes into place. If you do not have a document in place, then um, it's if you're married, it would be your spouse. If you have adult children over the age of 18, it would be one of your children. Uh, and if you don't have, if those don't exist, uh, if your parents are still alive, then they would make the decisions for you. Worst case scenario, uh, if you have nobody uh, that is available to make these choices on your behalf, Health uh, Cottage Hospital has a, um, I'm blinging on the name, they have a team that is basically uh, doctors and nurses that are uh, looking through your patient profile and making decisions on your behalf. So uh, long answer short, there are different uh, avenues uh, that need to be followed for decision making, but I can't stress enough how important it is to complete your document. Otherwise you literally would have a stranger making decisions uh, on your behalf. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. if, and I just shortly add, if you're unable to uh, um, to answer for yourself and make decisions, it's typically the physician who's making that call uh, that you are un do not have the capacity to make your own uh, decisions. And I remember my mother had built into her documents on the advice of her attorney that if two doctors had declared her um, mentally incompetent to you know express her own decisions that I could step in and I actually had had to have uh, that done <clears throat> so if my family does not live in Santa Barbara will this document work for them uh, yes so on page four uh, there are some frequently asked questions in the document there are some states in which this document does not meet the probate or legal code those states include Alabama, Indiana, Kansas, New Hampshire, Ohio, Oregon, Texas, and Utah. So if your family members live in one of these states, they will need to look for a document that meets the legal probate code in that state. They can just go to their uh, local hospital and ask for an advanced directive. Uh, if they do not live, live in these states, then they can absolutely complete the document uh, that we're using here, the MyCare, and submit it to their healthcare, um, their local hospital. Okay. Does executing this document impact the quality of healthcare I might receive? Not at all. No, it, it shouldn't. Uh, it's actually uh, intended to enhance the, the quality of care, right? So because you're deciding what type of care you want to complete, uh, they should be doing what, making sure that your wishes are met. So no. Similar to the first question, what is the threshold for deciding when someone is incompetent to make their own decisions? I think we kind of answered that. And Yes, and I would say uh, check with your medical doctor for what that looks like in your case. Um, I am not a medical doctor. I'm not here to provide medical advice. So I would encourage you uh, to, to talk to your doctor if you're worried about that. Okay. So again, we're looking forward to uh, the next workshop. For those of you that wanna attend, I'm gonna turn this over to Andrea for final comments. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Adriana and Charles. Um, we so appreciate your presentation and the great service you're doing for this community. And thank you, Denise, the chair of the museum's plan giving advisory council for the recap and for leading our Q and A. Um, I think all of us are thinking more about our own health, mortality, and what kind of legacy we wish to leave. As you consider your plans, I hope you might consider leaving a legacy gift for the museum. And I'm here to help with any questions you might have about how to do that. Uh, as a follow-up, you'll see on your screen, we do have that workshop as Adriana mentioned. Uh, caseworkers from hospice will be here at the museum Thursday, March 2nd from noon to 1.30 to help answer any questions. And with the notary on site at the museum's Fleischmann Auditorium, um, I think that's a wonderful opportunity to take advantage of the free notary services. We will then have the uh, caseworkers shepherd your 
uh, plan into Cottage Health, and so you will get it done, which will be wonderful. A uh, couple of things on your calendar there, mark the upcoming webinars that are uh, being put on by the Museum's Plan Giving Advisory Council, Tuesday, June 13th at noon, along with September 12th at noon. Um, and then in November, the Plan Giving Advisory Council will be hosting a free estate planning essentials workshop, and that will be Sunday, November 12th from three to five, again, in our auditorium. So thank you again, Adriana and Charles. Thank you, Denise and our Plan Giving Advisory Council. And thank you to all the attendees for coming. We hope to see you on Thursday, March 2nd to get it done. Have a great day and happy Valentine's Day. Thank you so thank much, you. Andrea. Thank you. And the museum.